Good afternoon everyone, Peter Newman from ARI here. Uh, welcome to this Weed Smart webinar. We are doing eight this year and uh, yeah, glad to be bringing you another Weed Smart webinar. Um, so we are just getting organised, getting connected. We've got Tim Condon coming on today to join us uh, where we'll be talking about windrowing and we'll also talk about crop topping. Tim actually got to Grenfell and found that the internet connection wasn't good enough, so he has madly just driven to Young, and he is just connecting up, so uh, he'll get on in just one or two minutes, and uh, what could possibly go wrong. In fact, I can see him joining up now, so looks like we'll be good. So I'll just do a minute of, uh, of housekeeping, and then, uh, and then, yeah, we'll get stuck into the webinar. So just that little bit of housekeeping, let's just talk about Weed Smart for a moment. Weed Smart, as most people know, is an industry-funded initiative. The industry really wants a single voice about uh, managing herbicide-resistant weeds coming from the industry. And so what they've done is everyone has pulled resources. Uh, all of those companies there in the top half of that uh, screen are financially contributing uh, money to the Weed Smart initiative, with GRDC being a major contributor. And the uh, companies along the bottom, including ARI and Delta, life, etc. They are uh, in-kind supporters. But it's a great initiative because we're getting the industry to unite and uh, come together and provide that, that unique uh, setup where we are all singing from the same hymn book, if you like. So just a little bit of housekeeping. You've got the panel uh, for GoToWebinar probably on the right-hand side of your screen. If that's in the way, you can just click on that little orange and white arrow there and that will just minimise that. Uh, so it's out of the way, so it's not blocking your screen. Uh, we'd like a lot of questions to come in, so please make sure that you add a lot of questions uh, as we go, and we'll pause periodically and answer those questions. The more questions, the better. Makes this very interactive, and also uh, you might put some comments up about experience, which is good. So if you've minimised your uh, menu box there, just maximise it, type in a question, and then we'll get to it as we go. All right. Uh, here is a number for you to write down. Uh, I normally put up the webinar ID, but really, if you have problems, write down Ellen's number, which is on the screen. Ellen from Cox in All sits in the co-pilot seat, keeping this thing going nice and smoothly. So write down Ellen's number. If you drop out for some reason and you want to get back on, give her a call and she should be able to help you fix your connection problem. If everyone drops out, then everybody will call Alan at once and uh, we'll probably be finished. But, but look, let's hope we don't have any of those problems. So uh, that's enough about housekeeping. Tim seems to be there. Looks like we're ready to go. Uh, can you hear me, Tim? Are you all good? Indeed. Hi, Pete. Hi, everyone else. Uh, well done. That was a fantastic effort, Tim. <laughs> So half an hour ago, Tim was in Grenfell, now he's in Young, and he's got decent internet, and uh, and he's joining us today. So we're talking about windrowing or swaddling of crops, not to be confused with narrow windrow burning, of course. We're also going to talk a bit about crop topping. So those things that we can do at the end of the season uh, to maximise our harvest weed seed control, and also to stop seed set with crop topping. So I've uh, prepared a big slide deck here, which I'll go through, and Tim will come in with lots of comments. So the way we'll run it today is I'll, I'll introduce each sort of slide, and then I'll be thrown to Tim for comments as we go. So Tim, if you would just like to perhaps uh, give everyone a quick introduction of yourself, where you're from, and how long you've been there, and that sort of thing, and, and uh, introduce yourself, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Look, I'm uh, Tim Conn, a senior consultant with Delta Ag based at Harden on the southwest flats of New South Wales, which is a you know, pretty reliable cropping zone, farming zone. I've been in the agronomy game for 20 years plus and yeah, pretty passionate about the smart management of wheat. Good on you. And Tim's been very generous with his time with Weed Smart since the outset, um, giving up his time to be on committees and so on. Also, Delta Ag and Tim hosted Weed Smart last week. We went to New South Wales, had two fantastic events. Delta Ag really showed showed us how to put on an event, and uh, yeah, we're very grateful for that. So thanks for joining us, Tim. And I note that you said 20 plus years. When we get over 20 years, we sort of say 20 plus, don't we? We don't really want to admit how many years over 20 it is, I don't think. <laughs> Right, let's have a go here. So let's talk about swathing first. Uh, and the reason we want to talk about swathing or windrowing in this context for weeds is we 
we're looking to bring harvest forward and, and improve harvest weed seed control. I want to go straight to this slide here. This is data from Michael Walsh and uh, Michael Walsh at RE did nine trials in 2008 to look at the seed retention of weeds at the first available opportunity to harvest and then every week after that for a few weeks. So at day zero on your chart there, that's the first opportunity to harvest and then you can see the vertical axis is the seed retention percent. So wild radish at the first opportunity to harvest has 100% seed retention on the plant and that drops only to the, you know, into the 80s a month in whereas a weed like uh, wild oat, for example, um, in this study had 80% seed retention at that beginning of harvest and down to about 40% a few weeks in. So that's some WA data. I'd probably ask Tim, uh, what do you think about that, and particularly probably the wild oats question. Is that relatively accurate, do you think, for wild oats in your part of the world, or is that a little optimistic? Well, at first glance, you would think it is a little optimistic because we tend to say, you know, that wild oats will shed out, leave them in, they'll shed out if they won't contaminate the sample was the old adage. But now what I think happens, Pete, is that these wild oats that are the problem are late emerging wild oats. So quite often they are still quite green as the crop starting to senesce and ripen. So it's not that uncommon to have that much wild oats retention now when the wheat or the barley in particular is ready to harvest. So yeah, I, I, I'm in agreement with the numbers. Okay, and Tim, are there any other weed uh, species that spring to mind that you guys are thinking about targeting with harvest weed seed control in your part of the world that might that might shed that uh, that uh, that's not on that graph there? No, they're, they're the, certainly the four target weeds, particularly the latter three. They're escapes from our control programs that we've put in place, and in particular, probably wild oats is, is emerging as a bit of a contentious weed for us with its resistance status building and, and becoming more resistant, more prevalent, in, particularly in uh, barley crops. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's much outside that scope of weeds that's relevant. Excellent. And so when we're talking about using swathing as a tool, perhaps in a, like a barley crop, for example, we're talking about um, using swathing to keep, uh, stay at day zero for a while. So. We, if we have wild oats retaining 80% of their seeds at the start of harvest and we can swath then or even a week earlier than that, we can potentially capture 80% of the wild oat seeds with harvest weed seed control. And so that's really what it's all about. And, and as you can see there with something like wild oats and brown grass really starting to shed weeds as harvest goes on, this is the true strength of, of using swathing to make sure that we can capture weeds like those rather than have them shed by the time we get to do them. So let's talk about the swathing program for a minute um, and we're going to focus a little bit on barley. Uh, it's quite a topical, uh, topical crop for swathing um, and in terms of timing, I mean there's a few different ways to, to work out the correct timing. People I've spoken to, um, firstly one way to look at it is when the peduncle, so the peduncle is that little bit of stem just below the head. When that has turned from green to brown, that's full crop maturity and if you swath after that, then there's no risk to yield and so on. So if the peduncle is brown, swathing timing is on. People also talk about making a thumbnail in the grain. They also talk about 30 to 35 percent moisture. So Tim, uh, what sort of technique do you use to um, to pick the right time for swathing a crop like barley? Yeah, it's something that you, you can get quite anxious about because you want to get it right. And uh, so you, you do get a bit anxious about getting it right. So typically in a paddock of the area of trees or, or a ridge line or an area that ripens faster. So if you get into that area as it's ripening, you, you can follow the process. So I actually use a thumbnail one more often than not as a, as a pretty good estimate of a 30 to 35% moisture. So going really that, that's just, if you use that as your rule, then you can't go too far wrong. And so if you follow the crop so if you go into those areas which ripen really fast, you can see the crop ripening and you can see how those grains are hardening up before, and, the, and then when you go out into the crop properly, it's still a bit soft and green. So you can see the process is happening at, at relatively out time. So tell me what you're looking for with the thumbnail test for the right timing. Well, just uh, get, a, get a head in the grain and, and just push your thumb between your thumb and your forefinger on, on, on push your thumbnail into the grain and see what sort of a groove it leaves. So you're just looking for, you, know, you, don't, you obviously don't want rock hard, you're just looking for a bit of a groove there. 
Yeah, and if it's too early, you make a dent with your thumbnail and it sort of springs back into shape, does it? Yeah, you make a pretty big dent with it, and you can see it's still pretty soft and spun. Yeah. So, yeah. So, and everyone knows what grain's like when it's harvest hard. So, you know, you, and, and you're trying to, and it's quite, and when you, at this stage, you, the grain's still big and plump and you're really squashing and ship, shifting out of shape quite easily, or you've got to wait for longer. Yep, and we just had a question coming through. Is this the same for wheat? I don't know if you've had experience with wheat swathing, have you, Tim? I have, and, and it is the same. I mean, the uh, same principles apply. And, yeah, we, we've often swathed wheat more for Ravanda Sana with pasture, so the same principles apply. You just wait till it is at, at that 30 35% moisture, which you can tell with the thumbnail. Excellent. So one thing we have with the uh, direction of swathing is the next thing to talk about. Um, if we consider that that is the seeding direction, if we are to swath in the same direction of seeding, we can have that uh, swathed barley collapse onto the ground and therefore it's very hard to pick up and also if it rains you've got barley sitting on the ground and you've got your whole income lying on the ground wishing you could pick it up. Uh, so this is one of the big negatives of swathing and yeah, Tim, have you had any experience with clients having problems picking up the swath or, or getting rain on them and having it go pear shaped? Yes, it, it can happen. So you need to be looking at the weather forecast as well and if you're about to think of, you're thinking about swathing and you can see a significant change coming with a significant rain event, well you wouldn't go ahead of it that rain event, you'd, you'd wait till after it. So in your graphic there, Pete, you've got the seeding direction, obviously you're seeding up and back. You don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to go in the exact same direction. If the seeder is saying this way, you have to swap over the top of the seeder every time. So the other key thing seems to be swathing height. If you swath too high, it does the swath does tend to fall down into the stubble more and you have trouble picking it up out of the, out of the stubble. So you need to get your swath Swathing height quite low, you know, the old, um, talk about beer can height or boot height for harvest height. I think that's quite relevant for swathing the barley. Excellent. And look, what we're talking about is an alternative as well. So you, uh, height is one thing, but swathing at an angle uh, is the other one. And, and I've got a bridge there. This is the Ray Harrington analogy saying that uh, if you swath at an, out, at an angle, uh, then your stubble rows become like bridge pylons and, uh, and the barley sits up on top of those bridge pylons. And so people are swathing at either 90 degrees to their seeding direction, some are swathing at 45 and some are even swathing just at perhaps say a 15 degree angle. And from all reports this works very well, all of the different angles are working to keep that swath up off the ground. and. Um, and making it easier to harvest and also reducing that risk of, um, of weather damage. I was talking to Ray Harrington before this webinar and he said that he had swathed at 90 degrees years ago, did a little trial area. Six weeks later the swath was still standing up uh, off the ground and sitting up off the ground able to harvest and, and it got rain on it and it wasn't a problem. So yeah, any other comments on that angle approach Tim? Well, it, it certainly does benefit and it's uh, all about keeping the swap off the ground so it can dry out in, in the event of rain and, and getting it to feed into your header nicely. So whatever you can do to, to do that and, and that's just a matter of playing around with it. I mean, some clients have tried it and didn't like it. They just didn't, no, it didn't work so they just kept uh, swapping straight down in the direction of sowing and, and once they got things happening, we'll talk some more about CTF systems in a minute. But, it uh, wasn't an issue. So it's, yep. it's just like a matter of just playing around with it and looking at where the swath, the swath's doing and seeing make it really happy that it's actually sitting up off the ground. It does depend a bit on row spacing. Now our rows, row spacing is obviously a bit easier to pick it up off the ground. And again, I think that harvest height is pretty important. Yep. And so um, you've just raised another issue there and what about control traffic farming? Obviously if you're in a control traffic farming system, the last thing you want to do is go at an angle go and compact the rest of the paddock. And so uh, here's a solution. The other day we were in one of the workshops um, in New South Wales with Weed Smart and Ray Harrington got up and said to, uh, to swath on an angle. I put that on Twitter. Instantly 
a whole heap of people said no good for CTF and instantly there was a solution came up. And uh, I love Twitter and uh, here's the solution that came up. This came from Quentin Knight uh, on Twitter and he was talking about how growers in the Esperance region use a, a mixer belt to, um, to on the swather. So rather than that, the swath just falling into a gap there, they have that mixer belt running uh, backwards so that uh, we end up with like a cross thatching effect which holds the swath up and, and this next slide sort of shows that cross thatching effect where the barley sits up on an angle uh, and once again it keeps it up off the ground and um, Quentin's comments were this is very good for rain because it's sitting up on an angle, uh, rain does sort of shed off it very well and, and people in the Esperance region are having a lot of success with this. So there you go, there's a good um, simple answer coming straight out of Twitter to one of our one of our issues. Yeah, any other comments on that one, Tim? We, we can also fiddle with belt speeds. So, in some machines, you can have one belt going slightly faster than the other. So, that, but it's the same principle. We're trying to throw the barley into each other so that it doesn't just. Like you're not just trying to get it all to lay on one spot and lay in one direction. You do want to try and thatch it up, and, and that can be done with belt speed adjustments as well. Yeah. And one of the questions that's just come in, Tim, and I don't know if you've got experience with this, but uh, picking up, do you pick up in the same direction as the windrow or do you try and pick up in the opposite direction? No, generally, generally what I know, the same direction. Yeah, so the same, and I'm, same guessing, direction. Uh, I'm guessing if you've gone on an angle and you've got it sitting up or you've got this cross thatching, that, that that direction of pick up is probably less of an option because it's sitting up, less of an issue, I beg your pardon. Yeah, that's right. I think, I think it is less of an issue. And it does generally feeds in quite nicely. Yeah. And a couple of questions came in about row spacing. You already raised it, Tim, and a couple of other people put that up last week, saying that if you are at narrow row spacing uh, and you've swathed nice and low, then, um, then the swath hitting the ground isn't, isn't such a problem. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, look, we're going to leave swathing there. Uh, keep any questions coming in. If you've got another question about swathing barley now or windrowing barley, please uh, put it up now and we'll get to it. But really just in summary, um, we're talking about using swathing to bring harvest forward to set that weed seed shed on day zero for a period of time. Some people find themselves swathing their canola straight into swathing barley and then if they've set it up right, they can go and harvest other cereals for a while and come back to that barley later. Uh, and so it can sort of bring the whole harvest program forward to uh, maximise that harvest weed seed control, seed capture. And we've also talked about some issues of, of keeping that swath off the ground. So using a, a mixer belt on the swather or, or, so it, or swathing on an angle. So um, look, that's, um, that's all good discussion, I think. And Tim, I don't know if you've got any last things to add about swathing. Yep, like the key thing here, Pete, is it's a, it's a key thing for barley in our part of the world that we're trying to manage wild oat resistance. You've got wild oat escapes, don't let them go back into the seed bank. This is a great tool to, to manage and get them into the window where you can get disposed of them later. Excellent, yeah. All right, so, um, so we're going to uh, just mention one other thing now, which sort of came up last week on our trip to New South Wales, and that is getting harvest weed seed control into some of these areas. Tim, you're in a high yielding area there where burning narrow windrows in high yielding cereals is not uh, very achievable and uh, it's pretty hard work. And so, and we're waiting for uh, an integrated set Harrington seed destructor or the like, which will be very good in high production areas. But we did just talk a little bit about a concept which we'll just talk about for a minute now and that is um, particularly for high yielding areas where we might be using say a canola wheat or a canola barley rotation. And uh, this is Mick Fells, he's a grower from Esperance. And this is a technique that he's using. I don't think he was the first to use it, but he's certainly someone who's promoting it a little at the moment. Uh, it's called chaff lining. So what he's got there is just a chaff shoot. So it's just taking the chaff of the sieve and putting it the chaff only into a narrow windrow and the straw is still chopped and spread as normal. Uh, if we look at that from the back of the machine, we can see that we end up with this just a very narrow chaff windrow and on the right hand side of the screen there, 
is one of his chaff lines that wasn't sown sort of by accident. It was quite remarkable to see just how clean it was. Weeds just don't tend to like um, growing in chaff. And so, look, this is not a very researched subject uh, and it is a bit anecdotal at the moment, but it is possibly an extremely low cost option to get into harvest weed seed control and worth a try perhaps on a paddock or two or on a trial basis. So what we're talking about as the concept for using this might be something like year one cereal put down a chaff line um, in the cereal and I must uh, also add that Mick Fell's doing this has got a disc seeder and so it seems to be compatible with his disc seeder so he doesn't put a tine through that chaff line and and mess it up. But then in year two, potentially um, in say a canola or a lupin crop, but probably canola crop in this case, putting a big canola windrow on top of that chaff line and burning it. And so this is something that we talked about in New South Wales last week. And um, Tim, I'm just wondering if you would like to comment on, on what your thoughts are and, you know, is this worth uh, giving a bit of a trial in your part of the world. I think uh, people were quite positive about it, at least, at least giving it a trial. Oh, look, certainly, Pete, it's uh, on TTF systems where you've got really good AB lines and you can put the two chaff lines on top of each other year, year on year. You, and you need to be matched up with your wind rower and the whole shooting match if, it, if it's going to work. So it's going to be someone in the systems that whether all the maths work or it logistically work. But a great concept and a lot of interest in it because we still want to get that straw spread across the paddock to maintain our ground cover to try and capture more summer rain, which is a bit of an issue when we're harvesting canola and pulses where you just want to drop the chaff into the line and uh, and not spread the and be able to spread the straw to try and maintain some ground cover and with the cereals as well. So certainly a lot of interest in how we might better go about it and uh, we'll certainly be looking into it, Pete. Yeah, and look, that's as I said, it's pretty anecdotal. There's not a lot of scientific data on it, um, but certainly I think worth uh, giving a try. And I know we've got a few growers around the country that are just trying it on a paddock or two, and and it probably is going to take that two or three years before we sort of get a good feel for it to see if we do create really weedy strips or or do they end up rotting a lot like we suspect. But that's going to take a little bit of time. Just before we move on, there was go on, Tim. We import a bit of info on how we actually set up a little shoot to just get the char fraction in that, in that window. Yeah, so I'll be visiting um, Mick Fells this harvest and uh, I'll be taking some photos and video and so on and we'll put it out through uh, Weed Smart and through Ari to, to put the idea out there. Um, just going back, there's a question come through just back to the uh, to the mixer belt idea and there was a question there about does the mixer belt run at ground speed or faster. Now I don't know the answer to this question and um, what I'm going to do at the end of the webinar is I'll put that up on, on Twitter and uh, see if we can get an answer to that one. Um, it, another question, does the chaff line shoot block up in heavy crops and I think the answer to that is no. Mick Fells is harvesting very heavy crops down in Esperance. They're, very typically four and five tonne crops in, of cereal crops in that part of the world. We're always amazed with harvest weed seed control, just how little chaff there actually is. If you see a chaff deck with a conveyor belt operating, you can see the ribs on that conveyor belt. They're only about half an inch high, so the amount of chaff is actually uh, very low if the, heater, if the harvester is set up right. So, uh, look, I don't think blocking uh, chaff shoot is an issue and normally when people design those things they have it quite open to the back so that if there is a bit of a blockage that it can clear itself. All right, just a reminder that WeedSmart's got lots of this info. The best way to go about it is go to the WeedSmart website, 10 point plan and uh, for the harvest weed seed control stuff click on capture weed seeds at harvest and you'll find a wealth of information there. All right, time to, um, to move on now and we're going to uh, spend the next sort of 15 minutes or so covering uh, crop topping before we finish off and uh, we're doing two topics in one today so we're probably trying to cover a little too much but I just wanted to do it now because it is that time of year when we are crop topping uh, crops around the country to stop seed set. So I've got some data here from research of mine and Tim's uh, got uh, 
all of his wealth of uh, agronomic experience. So between the two of us, we'll we'll go through this a little bit. But firstly, we'll just focus on on wild radish um, crop topping. Uh, in when I was with the Department of Ag, I was GRDC funded. We bought a small weed seeker, as you can see there, very small uh, trial bar. We set it up on the back of the Ag Department spray rig. We uh, went out into the fields at full crop maturity when the wheat is brown and the radish is still green and thought that here's an opportunity to stop seed set. So we had wild radish that looked like this in, uh, in mature wheat. And so what I'm going to show you is some trials that I did uh, on this, which is about using the weed seeker to stop radish seed set, but it's also uh, crop topping data, if you like. It could be applied to blanket spraying as well. What we're talking about is um, when we're talking about timing it for wild radish, it's very important to know what stage it's at. So if we have pods and seeds like the ones on the left of the screen where we crack open the seed and it's empty, then crop top spraying will sterilise that seed. Whereas if we have the seeds on the right where we have a large dark green embryo in the middle of the seed at the time of crop topping, uh, often we find that those seeds are viable no matter what we spray on them. The one on the far right you might get with a uh, paraquat or a regline, you know, diquat type product. The one on the embryo on the left is that seed is mature. So look, having a look at these trials, it was done back in 2006. It was a drought year. Uh, and that year we compared regline or diquat out of one and a half litres with Roundup Powermax. And I should point out that often two weed seekers came on, so sometimes we were getting a double dose of that. And here's the best bit of data that we ever produce. Um, we've got on the needle on the right, normal, just a normal wild radish plant. In a drought year, mind you, producing 5,700 seeds per plant, and the one sprayed with a high rate of Reglone producing 12 seeds. So this got us pretty excited. You can see that Reglone is also a lot better than glyphosate. Roundup, uh, but uh, Roundup's still very useful. One more bit of data, very similar. Um, this is, sorry, that's the seed viability. This first one, sorry, I'll just go back and talk you through it. This is the number of seeds, viable seeds per plant. This is the viability of the seeds, so what percentage of the seeds would germinate. So in the nil, you can see that we're looking at 80% germination of the seeds, whereas with uh, where we sprayed Reglone, we're only looking at about 7% germinability and round up somewhere in between. Um, I'll just keep going through these before you comment, Tim. Quickly, another tr more trials in 2007 where we were comparing Reglone and Powermax, but we also had some other treatments. So once again, very similar to the other results, Reglone better than Roundup, or Diquat better than glyphosate, if I'm to be politically correct, um, in 2007. And then we move on to having a look at some of the other products. So we've got Diquat versus Gramoxone for wild radish. And, and once again, as you would expect, Diquat being the broadleaf specialist, being better control of, uh, of wild radish compared to Gramoxone, Paraquat. Uh, and then we had one more trial where it was a more of a, uh, a large block trial. We had treatments applied on the 8th of October to lupins. Um, and uh, let me just have a look. This is this is the wild radish data. So we just had big blocks. Uh, we had a nil um, compared to gramoxone, and we found that we significantly reduced. This is the wild radish counts the year after spraying. And so we can see that both uh, paraquat and diquat gave significant results there, but diquat was more effective. Wheels only means that we just drove through the crop to measure the, um, the, the yield loss from driving through the crop. So look, that's a summary of wild radish, and it's not no surprise, but it shows that for stopping seed set of wild radish, diquat is better than paraquat, which is better than glyphosate, or reglone better than gramoxone, better than glyphosate. And we get the best results when we're applying to wild radish flowers or immature pods. So Tim, uh, no surprises there, but um, just wondering if you'd like to make any comments from what you've seen. Yes, well, I mean, the main crop for this uh, sort of activity is typically the pulse crops. But uh, just a comment that, that they do provide a wheat, a cereal crops as much as they do the pulse crops as well. So 
the advantage of the pulse crop is you can dry it down and get it ready to harvest in one hit. So there's a double advantage of spending sort of money you need to spend on reg loan if you want to go that way. But uh, it, it, it obviously is very effective. Yes, and um, we know that there's a registration for some glyphosate products in cereals and also reg loan in cereals, but definitely not um, bromoxone in cereals. So. Yeah, we'd ha you have to go through each crop one at a time to look at all the registrations. But look, that's just a bit of data, so, sort of showing no surprises, but um, but definitely very useful. Now, one question that comes up, people keep asking me, what about Reglone or Diquat for ryegrass control? Because a lot of times people are crop topping, or sorry, they're desiccating canola uh, with Diquat ready for harvest, and um, wondering if they're getting any ryegrass control. So. Here is just a bit of data on that uh, from this uh, same era of doing crop topping trials with the Department of Ag in uh, 2003. I did this one with Michael Walsh, GRDC funded, and um, you can see that we had two times of spraying, T1 in the blue, T2 in the red. So T1 was a little bit on the early side for the loop and crop in question. I blanked out the off-label stuff there, so <laughs> but that's not very interesting anyway. It didn't do much. but you can really see this is ryegrass germination. You can see this T1 early spraying with paraquat on uh, with para, well, with uh, yeah with paraquat in lupins really gave a huge reduction in the ryegrass germinability. But the diquat was really uh, lucky to be you know 50% control. It's probably 30 or 40% control. When we go to the later timing, the high rate of paraquat uh, giving you about a 30 or 40 percent control of the ryegrass, whereas the diquat doing almost nothing for that later timing. So yeah, once again, Tim, I don't know if you've seen any other data on this, but um, we'd like to think that we're getting some good um, seed set control when we're desiccating canola with uh, diquat, but I really don't think we are. Yeah, no, a whole lot of experience with diquat, but so, uh, more so with um, with glyphosate. But yeah, look at. The expectations would be that the moxin would be superior, but, but um, yeah, I think, I think no surprises there. No. All right, so let's just move to crop topping ryegrass in lupins, and we're down to our last sort of uh, few slides here over the next few minutes. And once again, these are trials that I did back in the day. And so well, I'm talking about lupins, but obviously we've got other pulse crops around the country that uh, where we may crop top. This is a particular trial I did, as you can see, we a lot of ryegrass in a leaven crop. It was a beautiful, beautiful trial site. And um, and bear with us while we go through this slide. So we had two timings, timing one in the blue, timing two in the red. We were comparing bromoxone and Basta in this trial because at the time there was talk of a Basta tolerant lupin coming out. So we wanted to know if you went early which was timing one was sort of too early for crop topping in this trial. The lupins were still very green. But if we assume that we had a Basta tolerant lupin, could we get some ryegrass control by going early on a GM Basta tolerant lupin? Um, so Basta I don't think is registered. I might have to check that for current lupins. But we were doing this wondering if we would get a GM lupin. And then we had the low rate of paraquat, bromoxone, 400 mils versus 800 mils at timings one and two. And you can see that we lost a bit of lupin yield by going too early at timing one, uh, but timing two, the products were safe. If we look at the ryegrass control that we got, timing one with paraquat killed it, and 800 mils was better than um, 400 mils. Uh, Basta was a very distant second in this case, so very disappointing. Basta is glyphosinate. An alternative knockdown herbicide. That's the Liberty Link crops that we hear about from Canada and so on. We wanted to know if this was going to be applicable in Australia. Um, look, this this is just one trial, but it didn't do much of a job here. But it, this what this trial does show is that uh, going early we get better control and 800 mils better than 400. Um, and look, there's a heap of crop topping uh, ryegrass um, information out there, but uh, all of the data really points to being the high rate of paraquat, where it's registered, of course, being the best product, up to milky dough of the ryegrass. Now, years ago, we used to talk about it, the high rate would get us into hard dough. 
whereas I think the trials are really shown that we've got to be at milky dough to get good control um, with crop topping um, ryegrass. And if we go too early, we'll use, lose yield. So we're not going to go into all of the different pulse crops today for crop topping. Uh, they all have very specific timings, but it is always a race between the weeds and the crop. And very often when it comes to crop topping time, the, uh, the weeds uh, are done and the crop isn't ready for crop topping and the window doesn't match up. And so, but we can't afford to go early and lose a heap of yield. Yeah, but Tim, just wonder if you wanted to weigh in with some comments on, on crop topping uh, from what you've seen and, uh, and, uh, and which products of choice and which crops. Yes, look, as you said, it's always a bit of a race to, to get the get the ryegrass before it gets too far gone. But certainly in pulses, it's it's we've done it done a relative high amount of crop topping, and quite often these days you put a good program in place. You've got low weed numbers. You've got a good pre emergent program. And a lot of the weeds you're chasing with this sort of technique is to survive, so they do tend to be these days, I think, more so than perhaps when you're doing all that work, but these days they tend to be more later emerging. So quite often there's a good fit these days, and, and it's the critical thing is to get the timing of your pulse crop right to make sure you don't have a negative impact on your pulse yield. And we could talk all day about how to determine that, but the best bit of advice is probably just to go to the Pulse Australia website and the heap of information there, but again, the timing right. If you're not sure, just get someone alongside you to help you work through the process. Yeah, and so there's a question just came through, how late can you crop top wild radish and fuel peas without affecting yield? And I mean, firstly, I think the thing is to, like you say, get agronomists, get Pulse Australia, work out that safe timing for the crop and don't go before it. Some people say, look, I'm going to sacrifice some yield, uh, but I'm going to get the weeds. Whereas I really believe, look, we can't afford to grow a crop all year and then go and blow away a heap of yield. So I don't know the specific timing of field peas. I don't know if you can help us out there, Tim, or, or whether we just need to prefer that person. Oh, yeah, we're probably going to get you get a bit too deep into, into how you determine it. So I think rather than get, go down that path, a bit off just to like, you know, refer to Pulse Australia or you know, get someone beside you who doesn't know how to do it, which is which is um, not that hard, I don't think. Yeah, so I'll and put on please, Twitter that link to Pulse Australia in just a moment. Yep. Yep, and there's plenty of really good info there about how to determine the right time. And the other thing I guess is we've talked about swathing barley, and this is swathing pulses is probably the default situation when it gets too late. When you've got your mm. plan in place, you want to do your crop topping, but you miss the, miss the boat for whatever reason, it just happens that way. Well then, the next default position can be swathing the, the pulse crop. Particularly in our part of the world, deep in the and say, it, it, it can be a good solution to get not let the weeds fall on the ground, but capture them from the ground. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I'd say about um, crop topping timing for wild radish and field peas is you really got to go and have a look at the whole wild radish plant. And sometimes you look at them and you find some viable pods and you think, oh, look, we've missed it on this plant. But if you look, you'll find viable pods at the base of the plant. As you go up, you'll find some immature pods and then at the top a heap of flowers. Now, if you do nothing and you let that plant go, it might set 5,000 seeds or even 10,000. Whereas uh, even though you have some viable pods there uh, and you might have to wait for a while for the crop for crop topping, you can still get at least 70 and often 90% seed set control of wild radish in that situation. So even though you might see viable pods on a wild radish plant at crop topping timing of a crop like field peas, um, it still can often be worthwhile because those things can keep growing for three or four more weeks and set a heap of, heap of seed. Okay, we're just about ready to wrap up. So any last questions, get them in now. That's just the summary of what we've said today is swathing or windrowing is about bringing harvest forward and reducing the shedding of weed seeds so that we can maximise the capture through harvest weed seed control. Swathing at angle or using a mixer belt can improve that harvestability and reduces risk. And so, uh, yeah, we'll put some more information up on that on Weed Smart as we go. But this is a, a real key. People are really worried about putting their whole income on the deck. Uh, if we can reduce that risk of losing yield because you can't pick up the swath, then we can achieve more uptake and swathing. 
Um, while radish crop topping timing, we know that diquat is better than paraquat, is better than glyphosate. Uh, ryegrass paraquat is, is the king, uh, but in all cases, not too early, I believe. I don't believe we should take the opinion of, uh, of sacrificing crop yield. We're about growing crops rather than killing weeds. We want to maximise yield, number one. And uh, sometimes the crop topping window just doesn't match up and we just have to wear it. So, uh, yeah, I think there's another question or two coming through. But any last comments from you, Tim, about any of that? No, I think it's, it's all about doing your homework and having a plan. When you identify a situation where you want to employ these techniques and then just working your way through them as, as letting them evolve and really understanding what's going on and being very clear about the timing the lines in the sand with your time for the weeds and the crop. Yep. Uh, there is a question come through which is if we're crop topping with glyphosate, can we go earlier because it doesn't work instantly? So if we go a little bit earlier uh, on the crop so that we get the weeds at the right timing, um, can we um, forego any yield loss from glyphosate? I know on the wheat label it says 28% moisture uh, of wheat um, and I'm not sure about the timing recommended for all of the pulses but I think in principle this person is right that perhaps because glyphosate is slower acting than something like paraquat, um, going uh, that tiny bit earlier may, um, may improve the weed control with glyphosate. Uh, Tim, any comments? You might have some experience from pasture topping in your part of the world, I guess. Yeah, look, uh, I'd, be, I'd still be a bit cautious because it, whilst it is slower acting, it's slower because the plant can use up its resources, if you like, so as, as it starts to do it's shutting down enzyme parts. So I'd still be a bit cautious because even though you, you do spray early, you still can increase impact on your yield. So I mean, certainly in the in pastures, it's why we use it because you pick up a greater range of timings of from head emergence, like in the boot, through the head emergence to, to flowering. So for, for pasture topping, it is a more, more versatile product because you pick up a greater range of timing. So that's the same applies to crop topping. But as far as the impact on yield, I'm not so sure that it wouldn't have a negative, as big a negative impact on yield as you went too early. Yeah, and I guess the other issue that we have there is if we use glyphosate, it's another shot of glyphosate in our system, isn't it? Uh, crop topping is really a good opportunity to use those alternatives like your paraquats and diquats and those sorts of products. Um, there's a question came in, do you need to narrow windrow burn the paddock if you have swathed the crop? Well, possibly, but I guess what we're getting about with swathing is we are going to do that and then team it up with any one of the six harvest weed seed control tools. So swathing does go well with narrow windrow burning. It also goes well with the chaff guard or a Harrington seed destructor or chaff lining or chaff diversion to the tram lines. Any of those harvest weed seed control tools. The other one is, is of course, the bale direct system. Um, but yes, it can work very well with narrow windrow burning. Narrow windrow burning and barley can be very challenging because barley is a leafy crop and the paddock often gets away. So narrow windrow burning, high yielding barley can be a huge challenge. So, uh, look, um, yes, it's what we're talking about today is using this swathing in combination with any of those harvest weed seed control tools. Yeah, um, with, with, the, with that question or comment, with the wild oats in particular in barley, because it, they often late emerging and late maturing wild oats, when you do swath them, you actually really have a big impact on the ability to set seed. Because they just yeah. basically, they just, they just you, you swap them so early they, they haven't got the ability to set a viable seed. So you do have a big impact just for that practice alone. But if you can, because you're harvesting so low with barley, quite often you can actually do the narrow window burning quite effectively. So yeah, worth a go. Yeah. So if you're going to narrow window burn barley, the best way to do it is to swap it first. Yeah. I reckon. Uh, and I'm not sure if the wording of this question is right. There's one here. Have you ever experienced, I think it should be swathing wheat, and um, they have 150 hectares that, that they want to do. Um, Tim, any experience with swathing of wheat? Yeah, look, certainly we have. Uh, more recently for, for weeds, but also quite often because in our part of the world, we'll under so 
pastures. I put a pasture under the wheat cover crop and quite often if we have a wet spring, 2010, 2011 in particular, the pasture just goes nuts and, and you lose and swamps the wheat crop. So we've gone in and windrowed those crops quite successfully. Not even worried too much about all the um, no kidding, the drive has gone and windrowed them and come back in that later and harvest them very effectively. So yes, you can yes, do it. I know that the Hendersons in the Lakes District in Western Australia who were very early on in the piece with chaff carts and so on, they did a lot of swathing of a lot of crops including wheat and barley and uh, yet yeah, they had a lot of success in just bringing that harvest forward. Uh, and so look, all the same principles apply. You've got to get that timing right so you don't blow the yield and end up with screenings and all those sorts of things. So it's a matter of, of getting that timing right and obviously as we've talked about setting it up so you can pick it up off the ground. Another question was what chemicals are registered for crop topping on which crops? Look, that's a big question. Um, I know that paraquat's registered for a number of the pulse crops. Glyphosate is registered for some of them. I know that paraquat is not registered in cereals or canola. Um, glyphosate. Well, Jumping there, great, great little resource is on the uh, JAC website. So you've got a, a uh, fact sheet. So if you just Google yep. the fact, pretty harvest herbicide use. Yep. It's a uh, it's very tidy little fact sheet about what is registered for what on, on all the crops. So it's got wheat with what's registered, barley, canola and all the pulses. So Excellent. It's, quite, yep, it's a um, 2004 edition, 2014 edition, sorry, but it's uh, quite a good little fact sheet. Good one. I'll be looking that up and I'll put that on Twitter as well. So to find me on Twitter, I'm at Peter D. Newman. Uh, or you can just go to at WeedSmart. So we'll tweet that from from both of those um, from both of those Twitter handles. All right, I think we're getting to the end of our questions, Tim. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, we're very grateful. These webinars are a great way of um, connecting with a bigger audience, and uh, I'm very thankful for Tim that that you did make it to Young and that the internet <laughs> did work. So uh, thanks for your time and. Um, and we look forward to doing it again sometime. All good. Good experience. Thanks, Pete. Thanks very much. We'll see you later, everybody.